thanks so much, Judy. Wow, somebody really did some proper sleuthing there. There were some bits of bio that I hadn't even thought about for a long time. Um, and thank you so much to you all for coming. Um, I'm having a really wonderful year so far, wandering lonely as a cloud in my Radcliffe office. Um, I thought I would try to do something slightly different from what I usually do this afternoon um, and read poems, but try to talk a little bit more around them than normal. And I guess this is because, uh, for once, the audience might actually have more lawyers or physicists in it than poets, and I assure you this never, ever happens. <laughs> um, so I guess I, I hope that this won't seem an exercise in saying, oh, these poems are so difficult, look what clever things I've put into them. Um, it's, it's more me trying to show the way that I think and the sort of serendipitous connections and leaps and suturings of thought that go into a poem for me. Um, given that it's, it's working at the end towards this current project of mine, um, an erasure poem uh, about and for Hong Kong called Two Systems, um, there's a sort of uh, teleological uh, strand running through this talk. So th the poems I'm going to read today might seem a little bit single-minded because they're all effectively, to my mind, variations on a theme. Um, so I do have poems about buses and theoretical physics and love and walking home in the rain, but I'm not going to be reading any of those today. Uh, and this first poem, I think could act as a sort of prologue, because it's the same as, uh, but, but different to the others, in as much as all the other poems I'm going to read uh, explore the Chinese side of my heritage via uh, more or less directly my mum, whereas this poem is one that's firmly placed in England, my dad's country. Um, if you drive northeast from Cambridge, UK, where I used to live, uh, for a couple of hours, you'll eventually reach a place called Binham Priory in Norfolk. Uh, and there's a rood screen there, which is an object that has fascinated me for a long time. I think partly because uh, it feels to me like history in motion. Um, it, it's an emblem of, of history in some sense. Uh, so the rood screen, uh, it, it's a, a painting of saints, uh, which has been whitewashed and then overpainted in black letter script with text from Cranmer's Bible. Um, and this was quite common in the early Reformation in England. Um, and often the texts painted on top were sort of prohibitions against idolatry. Um, so this object is a sort of emblem of transition from a medieval culture of image worship to this sort of self-proclaimed Protestant culture of the word. Uh, but the punctum that made this into the germ of a poem for me was the fact that the fingers that have rubbed away at the whitewash have done it selectively. So the faces are the only areas that have been systematically uncovered. Um, and as the historian Eamon Duffy um, revealed, uh, people thought of this, uh, of whitewashing even at the time as a sort of reversible process that Catholic sympathizers might whitewash church art um, instead of more permanent sorts of destruction. So I'm going to read you this poem called Acts and Monuments, which has this epigraph. Um, As obedient children, that you give not yourselves over unto your old lusts. At the Priory's fall, its people came too late amidst clamour and cries. The glistering saints, torn from their Sunday height, each gilded screen and tabernacle, each tilted face, quite slubbered over, washed with white. As homily blurred into homily, Binham's flock continued to gaze, a whole generation, disobedient children, thumbed at the lime's forgetfulness, hoping to coax from stubborn chalk that serpent's peepholed green, a flash of wheat sheaf hair, almost as bright as ever it was. What I want to talk about today goes to the heart, I think, of what poetry is. Um, Heather McHugh puts it very beautifully when she says, all poetry is fragment. It's shaped by its breakages at every turn. And I suppose this is the sort of most recognizable thing that lets you distinguish verse from prose, that 
that jagged, broken right margin. Um, though I am going to actually read um, a couple of prose poems today, which I, I suppose trouble that division. Um, but for me, at least, poetry is an art fundamentally shaped by the white frame of the page that's tuned into the unsung as much as the singing, um, to wordlessness as much as words. Um, and so, as that poem, Acts and Monuments, suggested, I'm going to be talking especially to this idea of vacancy somehow made visible, um, how poems might frame an absence and in the process make it paradoxically more present. Um, and this is a painting that, just, that does just this, frame an absence. Um, it's attributed to a 10th century Chinese painter, Li Cheng, um, but it's actually probably a, a copy of a, a couple of centuries later. Um, and my thinking about this picture has been really indebted to the wonderful Chicago-based art historian, uh, Wu Hung, who's done lots of thinking about ruins and monumentality, uh, memory, absence and presence in Chinese art. Um, and for him, this picture is a, is a quintessential example of something called Huai Gu. Um, so lamenting the past. Um, it's sometimes translated as nostalgia, but actually I think it's not quite nostalgia, and it's not quite ubisunt. It's a bit different to the idea of confronting ruins in Western culture, but it's this moment when past and present are standing face to face. But as Wu Hong points out, the funny thing about this picture is that this steely, um, so steely, of course, are these uh, monuments which have uh, names or events or deeds um, inscribed on them that need to be remembered, um, it's blank. So unlike in poems of the period, uh, which very commonly depict ruins, so you have your poet standing on the hill looking down at the ruins of the old capital and thinking, oh gosh, lament, lament past. Um, uh, what you have here is this sort of odd displacement whereby the steely is intact right down to the tortoise base. Um, in fact, this sort of impression of wizenness and age is di displaced onto these contorted trees, if anything. Um, the steely is intact, but it's blank, as if the surface, the inscription, the writing has been worn away by time. Um, and with that in mind, I want to read this poem called Yangtze. Uh, although I was born and spent my early childhood in Hong Kong, I didn't actually ever visit mainland China until I was in my early 20s. Um, and this was back in 2004. And uh, one of the first things I did, as good tourists <coughs> do, is go on a cruise down the Yangtze. Um, but at that time, um, work for the Three Gorges Dam project had already begun. So the water level had already risen by a third. So it was up to here um, in 2004, whereas now it's sort of up to here. So your vista of valley and gorge is quite different to how it was a decade ago um, now. Uh, but what was most extraordinary at that time was travelling down this landscape, which felt like it should be in a classical Chinese painting. Um, you would periodically encounter these towns and villages that had been not just emptied and evacuated, but positively stripped down to the bare cores of buildings ready to go under the water. Um, Yangtze. The moon glimmers in the brown channel. Strands of mist wrap the mountainsides, crowded with firs. Declining cliffs sink beneath vast water by remote paths, twisting pines. Far downstream, two sides of a half-built bridge fail to meet. Our crude boat chugging points to Chongqing. As someone I now forget once said, journeying is hard. My face greets the evening breeze. I listen, the dream of a place. A cormorant dives by trembling light from the white islet of a star, the sound of ripples. A fisherman skirting shore in his high proud skiff crossing bamboo oars comes up with a jolt. Nets catch, not fish, but the wizened finger of a submerged branch, for below, a sunken valley persists. Slick, bare trunks, furred in wafting fronds, have water for sky, ghost forest. Roots rot deep in the hill where buried rock is still dry. Windows film, doors 
drift open in the empty concrete shells of houses, towns that once held hundreds of thousands, slowly filling with what? What is it they fill with? Someone I now forget once said, journeying is hard. The moon glimmers in the brown channel. Uh, Wuhung says one more interesting thing about this picture, which is that it has a relationship with the convention for representing Chinese ancestral tablets um, in art of this period, that they too are depicted as blank, blank tablets. Um, and the idea was that you should project into that space um, the image of your own ancestors. Uh, this is something that is sort of especially interesting and tinged with sadness for, for me because my mum was an orphan, so I have never known any Chinese family except for her. So when I look into the blank of my mental ancestral tablet, it is <laughs> literally blank. Um, and this is something that feeds into the title poem of my book, Loop of Jade. You're not meant to be able to read this, by the way. <laughs> uh, this is just to show what it looks like on the page. Um, the poem takes its title from the jade bracelet, this one that my grandmother um, gave me as a baby. Uh, and the, the poem is a way to think about sort of lines of inheritance, search for roots, but also things that might, one might not want to pass on. Um, but the most important things in the poem are left unsaid. So, for example, that my grandmother wasn't my grandmother by blood, and indeed I never knew her, but she was rather the woman who, um, after my mum was born and abandoned, sort of slightly tenuously took her in, adopted her. Uh, this was in Guangdong province in 1948-49. Um, so the communists came to power just as my mum was a few months old, and then this woman took her sort of just across the water to the safe haven of Hong Kong Island. Um, so, uh, yeah, this uh, is to illustrate that the poem sort of takes place in this counterpoint of two shapes. Um, and I've only actually performed this poem once before, and I think that experience showed me that I'm not really quite up to it because it, it, it demands two voices, which I can't quite do. So the, the prose um, sections are sort of putatively me, and then the uh, little sections... Um, uh, tell the story of the butterfly lovers, which sort of all, uh, it's a folk tale that all Chinese children would know, um, which goes something like, girl disguises herself so she can go to school, falls in love with fellow pupil, but when she's married off to an older man, he um, dies from grief, and then she hurls herself into his grave, everything's awful, but then God takes pity and they are turned into butterflies and they're reunited. Um, and you, it's only towards the end of the poem that you discover that this is the, these fragments of this story are happening and are being told in my mother's voice. Um, so I thought I would just read a couple of the prose sections. Um, oh, and by the way, I should say that this alternation of prose and verse is, is something that was inspired for me by a Japanese form called haibun, which... Um, is actually how many of the original haikus were presented, that you'd have these journalistic prose everyday sections and then these sort of heightening into little haiku sections. So I thought I'd read a couple of the prose sections and then there's a change of key on the last two pages of the poem. Um, so the penultimate section, this one, um, which is about trying to sort of score visually hesitation and difficulty, um, not so much a physical stuttering as a sort of psychological um, hesitation. Uh, this is a, in my mum's voice. Um, and then this last section is back to me again. And you can follow along in the handout if you want to, but actually I sort of wouldn't recommend it. But <laughs> <laughs> When the television has stayed on too long, the channels ended and all the downstairs lights switched off but one. Sometimes, rarely, my mother will begin to talk without prelude or warning about her growing up. Then her words feel pulled from a dark and unreflective well, willed and not willed. It isn't that this tacit contract is not tinged by our same daily fumblings, but when the men are asleep, 
I think she feel, believes it's someone else's turn to listen. Once she spoke of her horror as a very small child of the communal kitchen in their low-rise tenement. Half outdoors in that muggy climate, it ran across the whole row, a corridor or terrace. This space, aside from housing a blackened static wok the size of a western baby's bath, was also a latrine of squatting barefoot over the cracked tile trench and trying not to breathe. How, despite themselves, her eyes would follow to the nearby drain as it sprouted. Here she giggles, shivers, the glistening bodies of cockroaches like obscene sucked sweets. I see them, the colour of rust or shit, hitching up from the crusted grill on agile legs, things scuttling from some dank subterranean chamber of the head. Her longest and most empty pause, I've learned, comes before the word mother, as in my mother. She could speak Shanghainese. This, one of her trademark non sequiturs, at the table the family would laugh, arrived while scraping off dinner plates several months after a trip of mine to Shanghai. It's as though she's been conducting the conversation in her head for some time and decides disconcertingly to include you. Or one Christmas tucking the cooled mince pies into kitchen paper. I sometimes think she wasn't very reliable, my mother. What she told me, I don't know how much I can believe. In her mouth, that noun worried at me, for I would never naturally use it myself. Mother, except at an immigration office, perhaps, to total strangers or inside the boundaries of a poem. She places it in the room's still air with a kind of resolve, and yet a sense it's not quite right, a mistranslation like watching her wade, one dredged step at a time, out into a wide grey strait, myself a waving spot unseen on the furthest shore. There was a man in a nearby district. When I was young and my mother short of money, there was a while, a lot of times actually, when I was sent to live with other people, that man was one of those people. Looking back, it was better than the school on Macau. I learned more at his house. There were other children, other girls there too. At night, he would teach us the old stories, all singing together. People, they used to talk about him. These weren't just nursery rhymes, though I had never heard those before either. I mean, the classical legends and tales. He had a bad reputation. The legends, <coughs> like Shakespeare, had a lot of girls who dress up as boys so they will be allowed to go to school or to war. My mother heard about it, had me sent back to her. When I was old enough, I had to go to the school instead. There was one, The Butterfly Lovers. It was a poem and also a song. I used to be able to sing it all. He was kind to me. I don't think I ever taught you that one. It thuds into my chest this pendant ring of milky jade. I wear it strong on an old watch chain, meant for a baby's bracelet. Into its smooth circlet, I can just fit a quincunx of five fingertips. Cool on my palm it rests, the cynical eye on a butterfly's wing. When I was born, she took it across to Wang Tai Sin, my mother's mother, to have it blessed. I saw that place, its joss-stick, incensed mist, the fortune-casting herd, their fluttering tree-tied pleas, only later as a tourist. As for the jade, I never wore or even saw it then. The logic runs like this. If baby falls, 
the loop of stone, a sacrifice, will shatter in her place. Painfully knelt on the altar step, did the old woman shake out a sheath of red-tipped sticks and pick one to entreat my fate? And if I break it now, will I be saved? At exactly the same time as I was working on that poem, Loop of Jade, I also started work on a sequence of poems, very different uh, poems, not really autobiographical in impetus, though I guess they do touch on my life um, in certain oblique ways, um, based on uh, Borges's famous Chinese encyclopedia. I'm sure many of you know this, um, uh, possibly encountered it as I did um, in the preface to Foucault's Order of Things, um, where Foucault talks about the sort of uh, laughter that shattered all the landmarks of our thought. I'll, I'll just read it. These ambiguities, redundancies, and deficiencies recall those attributed by Dr. Franz Kuhn to a certain Chinese encyclopedia entitled The Celestial Emporium of Benevolent Knowledge. On those remote pages, it is written that animals are divided into A, belonging to the emperor, B, embalmed, C, tame, D, sucking pigs, E, sirens, F, fabulous, G, stray dogs, H, included in the present classification, I, frenzied, J, innumerable, K, drawn with a very fine camel hair brush, L, others, M, having just broken the water pitcher, N, that from a long way off look like flies. Um, so... This Chinese encyclopedia is cited, which is to say invented by Borges in, in one of his essays. Um, and I guess I always thought being half Chinese, half English, that this piece of Rai Shinwazri was somehow talking to, describing me. Um, and I think Foucault is right when he recognises that this is not so much about the sort of exotic charm of another system of thought. It's about the limitations of our own. Um, so what I did was I wrote 14 poems, one for each of the 14 animals. Um, like this one, D, sucking pigs. Um, so these poems use Borges' animals as a way of thinking about sort of culture and cultural and racial hybridity, I suppose. Um, uh, my own, also some of the later poems get into my own mixed marriage. Um, when my husband, who's Jewish, and I were planning our wedding, we thought it would be nice to somehow convey aspects of our heritage, so we sort of smashed a glass. Um, but, but then I was trying to read around to find out what Chinese aspects we could put into our ceremony. Um, and I <laughs> came across this custom uh, whereby the groom's family, upon being reassured, shall we say, of the bride's um, chastity, are supposed to give her family a, a roast piglet. Um, <laughs> in England, I sometimes have to gloss shiksa, um, and I know that they should strictly be blonde, um, but we are in the land of Seinfeld uh, <laughs> and Philip Roth. Um, and this poem is actually a Shakespearean sonnet, albeit with fuzzy rhymes. That is a technical term. Um, and, but the, in the couplet at the end, the second line is a footnote. Uh, right. Sucking pigs. Between choosing canapes and favours, I read how the groom's family, by Chinese tradition, should gift to her kinsman a piglet Milk fed, just a moon at the teat, crisped to perfection. <laughs> when quite satisfied, the bride's still intact. I imagine your mother cranking the spit. <laughs> Cracklings coy, brittle russet, then succulent fat. That atavistic aroma makes me sal salivate. You, physically <laughs> sick. <laughs> so, as pet names go, Shiksa's not a bad fit. I did play your Circean temptress. Wikipedia says it comes down from Leviticus, how your god labelled creatures unclean to ingest, but then disgust seems to blur into reverence. C.F. Xu Bing, a case study of transference. <laughs> um, so I guess I liked the idea that 
in these sort of cod scholarly hyper referential encyclopedia poems um, you might think that a case study of transference is some reference to a piece of psychoanalytic literature. Uh, but I also liked the idea that people who know the work of the Chongqing-born Chinese artist Xu Bing might connect it to this piece of 1994. Um, that, those are actually two live pigs um, in a pen in an art gallery space which are doing their thing. Um, and the male, as you can possibly make out, is... Uh, inscribed with uh, Latin text whilst the female is inscribed with Chinese text. But what you probably can't see from the zoomed out view is that it's actually nonsense written on both of them. So that you can see that this is no language, this Latin script at the top. And the Chinese characters are these sort of nonce made up ones that Xu Bing had actually come up with for a project of a couple of years earlier called Tian Shu, which um, translates as a book from the sky, which is a Chinese idiom meaning sort of nonsensical or illegible language um, from codes or down to sort of a doctor's illegible scrawl. Um, so... Nonsense is actually something that I like to think about and play with a lot in my work. Though that's not going to come up so much today right until the very end um, of my reading. Uh, and I sometimes wonder if this has anything to do with growing up, hearing my mum and everyone in Hong Kong speaking Cantonese, a language I couldn't understand. Um, and I wonder if that experience somehow made me a poet, um, or at least more susceptible to language as sound and cadence separated from sense. Uh, now I'd like to read three more poems from the Borges sequence, um, a sort of little trio um, or subgroup, all of which relate to censorship in one way or another. Um, so I didn't speak Cantonese when I was growing up. Um, I only learnt Mandarin as an adult, and as I went through this process of painstakingly and with great difficulty learning this tremendously hard language, one of the things that struck me most was all the ways that Chinese can pun that English just can't. So um, the characters, the written system, allow for this in one way, that uh, when a character sort of differs from another by just one dot or, or stroke, uh, they'll look similar but have entirely different meanings. And this is a sort of punning that became very important to the protesters uh, in the visual culture of um, the recent umbrella movement in Hong Kong, for example. Um, but even more common is uh, puns based on sound because Chinese is so full of homophones. So um, things will sound almost exactly the same or exactly the same bar the differences in tone. Uh, and I thought it was fascinating that this is something that has become a way for Chinese dissidents to uh, either get round or protest um, censorship, the so-called Great uh, Firewall of China. Um, so I think Borges would have approved of the fact that the now rather notorious grass mud horse of the top left, for some reason they look like alpacas, um, uh, first arose early in 2009 um, as part of a hoax on the um, online uh, interactive encyclopedia of Baidu, the sort of Chinese equivalent of Wikipedia, where people entered um, these ten <coughs> mythical creatures um, into the encyclopedia, uh, all of which had these names that sound like obscenities of one sort or another. Um, so the grass mud horse uh, became a sort of widespread, hugely popular internet meme in, in China in, in 2009 um, and on, and gave rise to this whole menagerie of subversive animals, including its mortal enemy, the river crab, whose name sounds um, almost exactly like harmony, uh, which, you know, harmonious society. It, it's become a euphemism in contemporary Chinese, whereby when you say to, you harmonise something, you mean you censor it. Um, so uh, two, other thing, two other memes uh, turn up in this next poem. Um, the Elephant of Truth, which um, apparently has been on the endangered species list since 1949, mm -hmm. and also the sensitive, fragile porcelain meme. Uh, I don't think I need to say anything else except maybe that um, Sang, Sangjie, um, the court historian of the Yellow Emperor, makes a cameo here as the legendary inventor of Chinese characters. Having just broken the water pitcher, this poem has an epigraph from a collection of koans called The Gateless Gate 
which goes, Bai Zhang picked up a water pitcher, set it on a rock, and posed this question. If you cannot call it a water pitcher, what do you call it? This fact I can't forget. My 30th year had hastened by before I learned to see how plum blossom lies one sidelong stroke of gum suspended soot away from regret. It said the man who invented writing, charged with this burden by the emperor, sought inspiration in the surface moods of water. But he was by the river when he spied in the finely cracking mud a hoof print, its brim still as a bronzed mirror, stamped there by some invisible creature, and understood his task. The moment he sketched the first character, the sky rained millet, and the ghosts wailed all night, for they could not change their shapes. Five thousand years later, in some remote coal mining district, sits an anonymous blogger, his face lit by more than just the ancient monitor. He ponders how strange it is, how useful that I beg you for the truth is pronounced the same as I beg you, elephant of truth, or that sensitive words, as in filters, crackdowns, sounds exactly like breakable porcelain. Done typing, he clicks submit. Recall the old monk's koan, the correct reply to Master Bai Zhang's question. His pupil kicked over the pitcher and left. Uh, this next poem revisits a figure who's been really important to me um, in my own work. Uh, he's quite a troublesome figure in lots of ways. Ezra Pound, one of the founders of modernism in English. Um, I think Eliot was right when he said that Pound was the inventor of Chinese poetry for our time, and that's still true now. Uh, Pound, um, Eliot based that judgment on Cathay. Um, maybe some of you will know it, uh, published in 1915. He, um, Pound's sort of free translations um, from the classical Chinese, poets like Li Bai, um, uh, which whenever you read Chinese or Chinese-sounding poetry these days, it is still drawing on Cathay, basically. Um, but this page here is actually from um, his sort of epic, unfinished, huge, sprawling work of synthesising historical and poetic imagination, deeply flawed, but also, I think, rather brilliant, called The Cantos, um, which he worked on for much of his adult life. Uh, and as you can see, one of the most immediately striking things about the cantos is that they have these Chinese characters in the margins, in <laughs> Pound's rather dodgy Chinese script, um, which, of course, is something that I recall deliberately in my own uh, work and book. Um, the reason Pound is such a troubling character, there are many, but one of them is his pro-fascist and vilely anti-Semitic wartime speeches for Radio Rome, which were what landed him after his arrest in 1945 in a death cell um, at the US Army Disciplinary Training Center just outside Pisa. Um, and the mental in instability fostered by these sort of hellish conditions he met in the cage um, were actually what eventually saved Pound from the scaffold for treason uh, in favor of an American mental hospital, St. Elizabeth's, where he spent most of the rest of his life. Um, the last cantos that he wrote uh, are often are called the Pisan cantos, and it's not straightforward um, eth ethically to be moved by them, but I find myself moved by them, especially passages like this famous one in Canto 74, when an African-American soldier, uh, Mr. Edwards, brings pound um, a packing crate to his medical tent to use as a writing table. Um, the Pisan cantos are elsewhere sort of horribly racist about uh, Pound's African-American guards and fellow soldiers, but this moment does have its sort of tug on the heartstrings. So where the last poem and the next one are to do with circumventing uh, censorship, uh, this one I, I sort of conceived as being about where we might draw the lines of, of free speech. 
oh, by the way, Kongfuzi is, or Kongzi is the Chinese name of Confucius. Stray dogs. Thou art a beaten dog beneath the hail. To think again of pound, bared to the sky at Pisa. The traitor's cage they built for him specially. Six by six feet of airstrip mesh and dust. Wire diamonds shadowed starkly underfoot. Day 25, DTC doctors transfer him to a medical tent. A swollen magpie in the fitful sun fearing the first signs of a breakdown. Three weeks in this here sun go and change a man, thinks Mr. Edwards, he with the face of the Baluba mask, as he flips over a packing crate, hang regulations, to fashion the traitor a writing table. Squat at his crate come desk, pound spreads flat the worn out covers of his dog-eared Confucius. He'd slipped it in his slack side pocket that day at the house, a rifle butt pounding the door. As he flicks through the analects, his hand starts to tremble. He pushes it hard into his temple, takes up the donated pencil stub, pull down thy vanity, near illegible, scrawling on squares of shiny latrine roll, now lodged in a library's vaults. Later, he gets hold of a GI pad Ruled lines turned 90 degrees like bars. No longer blithely ranting on Rothschilds as in his radio days, whether they are born Jews or have taken to Jewry. Circe's sty, glorious Kant. Our captive flutters again to the much thumbed page where, having lost his disciples at the city's east gate, Kung takes with equanimity the stranger's slur. Look at this man here. He has a face like a lost dog. Yes, smiles Kung Fu Tzu. Yes, that's quite correct. That poem is, of course, just a sequence of terrible dog puns, including that Ezra got sent to the pound. Um, uh, the third in the trio, um, by way of in direct preamble. This is a photograph I took in a public park in Chengdu in, um, a couple of years ago. And those of you who've been to China have maybe seen this phenomenon um, of writing calligraphy, in this case, a poem by Li Bai, um, in water using a sort of giant brush on the paving stones in parks. Um, so we, I spoke just now about Xu Bing's Tian Xu, Books from the Sky. This is Di Xu. So ground calligraphy or books from the ground. Um, I sort of like that connection. Um, it's a practice that, from what I can tell, seemed to arise in public parks in Beijing in the 1990s, but then spread around the country. Um, and this is the old man in question with his admiring audience of, I think they were physiotherapy students. Um, but anyway, this practice of ground calligraphy, I think it uh, chimes with a certain strand of evanescence or disappearance in Chinese art of recent decades. So um, Song Dong, a Beijing-born artist um, who began at an early age as a painter, but after the events in Tiananmen of 1989, was sort of traumatized and stopped work for years before returning as a conceptual artist. Um, in 1995, maybe having seen these old men in the Beijing parks, um, Song began to keep a daily journal, which he wrote out in water on a large flat stone, so that his uh, record of his days um, vanished faster than the days themselves. Um, the following year, in 96, on a freezing New Year's night, um, Song performed a piece called Breathing. He lay down in Tiananmen Square, his face to the ground, his lips almost touching the pavement, and for the next 40 minutes, uh, his clouded breath played over the concrete flags, um, the vapour freezing into a thin sheet of ice which lasted for a few hours and then was gone by morning. So this photograph and a couple of others are the only record of this performance. Um, I'm working my way round to Hong Kong, uh, this, by the way, isn't how this poem appears in my book. I just got excited by the gradient fill button on PowerPoint. Um, uh, 
In Chinese, the Tiananmen incident of 89 isn't known by its place name, but by the date, uh, June 4th, Liu Su, um, references to which are censored on the mainland. Um, for a time, uh, the invented date, May 35th, allowed Chinese web users to circumvent the ban. Uh, Hong Kong is the only place in China where the anniversary can be publicly commemorated um, and mass candlelit vigils take place every year and actually they sort of grow in force and numbers every year. Um, I won't say too much because it's all in the poem really, but this is my recollection of a solidarity protest, sort of fundraising event that took place in Hong Kong in support of the students in Tiananmen um, at the end of May 1989. Uh, even I think I remember that this was a sort of euphoric moment in Hong Kong when pe hundreds of thousands of people flooded into the streets um, in support of the Chinese democracy movement and thought um, that China would sort of be reborn in Hong Kong's image. We still don't know how many people died in the square. Innumerable. Poem on the eve of May 35th. In the early summer of 1989, when I was five, my parents took me on an unusual outing. It wasn't that the jockey club's Happy Valley track, at that time still epithetic royal, was unfamiliar to me. Every week I went there for an hour's swimming lesson in the too hot pool. My reward, an orange ice lolly from the freezer cabinet behind the clubhouse bar. But I knew things were different that morning. For one, I had never trod on the actual grass before. On race days, that was the preserve of the slow processing row of black trousered laborers, their cone hats and canes, who would follow on after the rumbling of the horses. Their job, with a practiced touch as of the blind, to feel out the slightest hoof-flung sod and tamp it back into the reperfected turf. I spent the day hoisted on my father's shoulders, staring out across the jellied mass of human heads. On the big screen, the dots of light weren't tickering the customary shifting dance of odds, but the exact words that would rise from the rippling mouths in the stands at all as the crest of skyscrapers stood watch. On the news that evening, I tried to pick out my waving self among the banners swell, the toy box people chanting and a buzz. A few days later, there were different pictures on the news. A man with two white shopping bags, edging crabwise on a faceless boulevard in another city where 23 years later, I would struggle for over half an hour to hail a cab. On rainy race days, the turf workers, still bamboo-brimmed, would wear transparent macs dotted with drizzle and the determination of a search party. Where they pressed the clumps back down, you would never know. And now, finally, on to my new project, um, Two Systems, uh, which I'm working on here in Radcliffe. Uh, though I actually began work on this poem even before the umbrella movement uh, gained momentum. I, I, I started writing it um, in the summer of 2014, last year. Um, it's an erasure poem that takes as its source text the basic law of Hong Kong, which is often called the former colony's um, mini constitution. And it's a document that was negotiated by Beijing and London throughout my well, through my childhood in 80s Hong Kong. So I sort of grew up in the shadow of the countdown towards handover, which was agreed in 84 when I was one. Um, the title itself is an erasure. Uh, it refers to one country, two systems, of course, the principle that Hong Kong's way of life should stay unchanged for 50 years after the handover date on um, 1st of July, uh, 1997. Um, one country, two systems supposedly guarantees a high degree of autonomy from China, uh, but what this means is sort of constantly uh, being negotiated and feared over right now. Um, uh, so I guess the idea that uh, Hong Kong should remain a sort of civil law uh, jurisdiction within a civil law state, capitalist pocket in socialist framework and so on. Um, but what intrigued me about the basic law 
is that it's a self-deconstructing, you might even say self-destructing text, um, which enshrines within itself the date of its undoing, uh, 2047. Um, on the basis that I think that you are all probably more familiar with the umbrella movement in Hong Kong than you are with the history of the Eurasia poem, I could be wrong. I thought I'd give you a sort of potted history to show that um, this, isn't, this is far from something that I've invented. So um, I guess it was popular from, uh, with Western avant-garde writers since the 60s. And so this is a famous example, Ronald Johnson's Radios of 1977, which um, erased most of Milton's Paradise Lost to give rise to this new, surprisingly affecting work. Um, it's sort of often praised for being sort of pound-like in its imagism um, out of the earlier poem's rubble. Um, Johnson described his process as being like etching, um, cutting away at each page. Um, and indeed, erasure poetry does have visual qualities that I think place, place it somewhere between art and literature. Um, and its rise probably has something to do with contemporary developments in the visual arts, so like Rauschenberg's erased de Kooning drawing, which does what it says on the tin. Um, so I've been trying to think about this visual dimension since I've been at Radcliffe, um, the texture, the materiality or otherwise of erasure. Uh, and I think Travis MacDonald's The O Mission Repo um, is particularly interesting in this respect. Um, MacDonald's source text is the 9-11 Commission report, which gives his work an obvious political valence. Um, but uh, he also has these sort of three different strategies for part effacing the background text. So, uh, by the way, I think this is the best page in the whole poem. Um, we have tried to remember that sight can sometimes see what happened in shadow. It's good, isn't it? Um, so, like here, a sort of fade or a uh, blur or a strike through, which reminds me of the fact that George W. Bush's favourite writing instrument uh, was reportedly a Sharpie marker. Um, uh, oh, and this is Tom Phillips's A Humament, which is based on W.H. Malick's late Victorian novel, A Human Document, which sort of takes the visual dimension to another level that I'm not sure I can personally uh, rise to. Um, I'm just going to read you th this first page of, of Two Systems, though I've given you three in the handout. Um, and so, as I said, I started working on this piece um, in the early summer of 2014 when Beijing released a white paper that sort of caused widespread consternation in Hong Kong and, and it was one of the spurs towards the um, Occupy Central umbrella movement. Um, uh, one of the things they were particularly afraid about was the idea that Hong Kong judges might have to show fealty to Beijing. Um, so I found it satisfying in a childlike way to set about these pages from the basic law with Photoshop's eraser tool, um, so releasing their anarchic, subversive, gloriously vulgar undersongs. Um, but you find in amongst the nonsense touches of sense starting to emerge, um, including uh, allusions to the current unrest um, about Hong Kong's path to universal suffrage. So I'll read it from this first page. The court of Kong is rat hall. Diction overacts such fence and rain affairs. Our region shall obtain a cat on quest. The cat of cat hall before all. E.g. joy, power to the people, hee hee. <laughs> <laughs> I've never read that before. <laughs> Zen shall entitle the age to dance. Number the citizens among the elect. Work the high organ of men over and over. Mini rat, mini dance. There is a need for art. <laughs> um, I won't read this second page, though it's in the handout, but um, what I found was interesting, that, that, that these characters start to emerge uh, as I do more and more of this, um, I guess in line with the repetitions in the legal text. Um, so there's this sort of hapless character called Reg on this page. Reg must approve, obtain the approval of people, um, who, in my mind, was a sort of allusion to the colonial past that Reg, for me, is like an irreverent nod to the Regina versus X formula of English law. Um, so he's a sort of cut-down version of Regina. Um, and then by this final page, uh, which is the one seeking to define a Hong Kong resident, uh, hardly anything is left um, except that haunting date of 2047. Um, so I'm sure we can talk more about this, but 
I think it's probably time to open up for questions. Thank you.